Hi, I'm Susan Glenn. We're going to be talking about uh, the importance of water relations to organisms. And this is from Chapter 6 in the textbook Ecology Concepts and Application by Manuel Moles and Anna Scher, published in the 8th edition, which was uh, 2019. And uh, when we're going to talk about water, uh, it's, it's really, you can't talk about biology without including water. The water content of organisms ranges somewhere between 50 to 90 percent uh, because we evolved in an aquatic uh, environment and uh, life on Earth originally was in a salty aquatic, uh, aquatic environment. So it's, it's built around that biochemistry, uh, which obviously made a huge difference when organisms uh, decided to move up onto land. And so we'll be talking about the importance of, of how we are accessing water on a terrestrial environments. So in some environments, organisms um, are losing water. Uh, other environments, they might be gaining too much water and uh, have to expend energy to get rid of water. So we'll look at the relationship between organisms uh, and the environment uh, where uh, in particular looking at water. Water and temperature are often related to each other. Remember, we can uh, uh, lose water through perspiration or through transpiration and uh, cool our bodies. So obviously this is related to the chapter before on, on temperature relations. So often when you're dealing with uh, chemistry in an in a aquatic environment, uh, you're often looking at the things dissolved in the water. Here we're really concentrated on the water itself and what the uh, chemicals dissolved in the water are going to do is reduce the concentration of water. So if there's more salt in the water, there's less water there. So we're looking at the water side of things as opposed to the salt side of things as our uh, important uh, factor of interest here. And so we're looking at water movement. Water will be um, moving from where areas where you have more water to areas where you have less water. So just like when we dealt with temperature, it was where you had uh, more heat. The temperature was the uh, heat would move from uh, warmer places to cooler places. Water is going to move uh, down a concentration gradient, uh, which is from where there's more water to where there's less water. So the tendency of water to move down concentration gradients, how big those gradients are, so how big of a change there is, will determine whether an organism is going to lose or gain water from its environment. And we know from uh, looking at the biomes and looking at the patterns of rainfall on the planet uh, that the availability of water on land is going to vary a lot. The tropical rainforest obviously has an overabundance of moisture all year and the hot deserts are obviously have a lack of moisture. And a lot of the work on uh, water balance and water relations has been done on desert environments because of the uh, severe uh, problems with trying to maintain your uh, adequate water supply in the desert. As with temperature, um, microclimate is uh, extremely important in understanding uh, water relations. And a lot of things we talked about temperature are obviously going to be linked with water because the higher the temperature is going to change your water relations and the amount of evaporation. So in order to understand how an organism is maintaining its water balance, um, we really once again are looking at microclimate and adjusting its behavior according to the different microclimates that, that it can uh, move into or can foster. When we um, are looking at water in the air, uh, understanding uh, that water um, moving from the organism into the air is one of our major cooling mechanisms was something we talked about in the last chapter. And evaporation does account for much of the water loss by terrestrial organisms. So we really do have to um, understand how we measure uh, this water loss and, and the water in the air. As water vapor in the air increases, so as you start to fill up the spaces uh, in the air with water molecules, 
um, the water, the air becomes more saturated with water. It starts to get more and more water in it. That means that the water concentration gradient from the organism, organism to the air becomes reduced. So the more moisture there is in the air, the less difference there is between how much there is in our body and how much there is in the air. If the concentration gradient becomes reduced, so there's less difference, then uh, we, we have less evaporative loss. You're going to lose less water to very humid air where there's a lot of water in it than you are to dry air. So as the water vapor in the air increases, the water concentration gradient from organisms to the air is reduced, and that means evaporative loss is decreased. Because of this, evaporative coolers work best if, it's, if the air is dry. So they work best in dry environments and dry climates, which is when you're in a dry climate that you don't want to be losing your water. When we're measuring the water content of the air, um, we talk about most commonly, we'll talk about the relative humidity. And the relative humidity is the ratio of the water vapor density to the saturation water vapor density. So what the saturation water vapor density is the um, maximum quantity of water vapor that the air can actually hold. And uh, so it's really a ratio of how much there is in the air versus how much it could hold. And then we just multiply that ratio by 100 to make it into a percentage. So relative humidity is expressed as a percent of how much water the air can hold. The saturation water vapor density. So if we're, we're looking at this um, uh, denominator here, the saturated water vapor density actually varies with temperature. So remember, if the temperature is higher, that means the air molecules are moving faster, they're pushing each other apart. So as the temperature increases, if we look at the um, molecules, uh, I'll actually make the air molecules red. As the temperature gets um, higher, they push each other apart, there's more energy, there's more movement. And as they push apart, that's putting more spaces in here for your water molecules. So those saturation water vapor density is, is going to increase with temperature. That's increase with temperature. Water vapor density is measured as the water vapor per unit volume of air. The saturation water vapor density is measured as the quantity of water vapor air can potentially hold. Temperature. So this is a diagram in your textbook showing you the relationship between uh, temperature on the x-axis and the saturation water vapor density, the number of grams per cubic meter on the y-axis. And this is a funny graph because what they've tried to do is they've tried to show you two uh, very different scales on here. Um, so we're just going to start with the, the orange uh, line. And the orange line here is your line for your saturated saturation water vapor density. And we can see that as the temperature goes up from freezing to uh, 35 degrees Celsius, that we can see that the air can hold more and more and more water. So we can go from having five grams per cubic meter to 40 grams per cubic meter. That's a lot of water being held in the air. The other axis on here on the right-hand side is another way of measuring the water, and that is looking at it in terms of the saturation water vapor pressure. So we're having water vapor pressure on one side and over here we have the water vapor density. Water vapor pressure is, um, if you think of it in terms of atmospheric pressure, it's um, how much of the the pressure of the atmosphere is uh, being contributed to uh, uh, based on the water. 
And so as temperature goes up on the x-axis, on the y-axis, we can see the water vapor pressure goes up. And, and you can see it parallels the water vapor density. So these are two different ways of measuring the amount of water in the air. So the water vapor um, uh, changes with air temperature. If you were asked to graph this, uh, you're going to put temperature across the x-axis because the temperature is the independent variable. And so we can go from that particular graph went from 0 to 40. If we're doing the saturation water vapor density, so remember it's the saturation water vapor density up here and uh, let's say you don't remember what the units were you could say from low to high zero you might remember the bottom is zero um, and and if you're going to put the units uh, don't forget here this what the units would be in degrees celsius here the units would be grams per cubic meter of air and so if we're putting numbers on here, make sure you put your units on your graph. And then uh, we know that uh, the amount of, of uh, water that the air can hold starts out quite low and then it goes higher and higher. So you're going to have some sort of positive relationship there. And actually, we probably don't want to start it out that low. We take a look at it. It started out around um, five or six grams per cubic meter. So from looking at it from the perspective of uh, the amount of uh, vapor pressure, the uh, which is often something that we use to understand or, or look at uh, water content in the air. Uh, the total atmospheric pressure is the pressure exerted by all the gases in the air. We know that the atmospheric pressure is going to be higher if we're down uh, at sea level than if you're on the top of the mountain. The water vapor pressure, so remember the water vapor pressure was uh, specifically the WVP, is the partial pressure so that is contributed by water vapor. The saturation water vapor pressure, which is SWVP, is the pressure exerted by that water vapor if the air is completely saturated. So all the space that, that water molecules can fit into is taken up by water molecules. The vapor pressure deficit is going to be the difference between those two values. So the difference between how much um, the air can hold at a particular temperature. So remember, once again, this is going to be temperature dependent. So at a particular temperature, we're looking at the difference between the um, saturation water vapor pressure, how much it can hold, and how much it's actually holding at that particular temperature. This is a diagram out of the textbook that uh, gives you a more visual idea of what we're talking about when we're, we're dealing with the vapor pressure deficit, when, when we talk about uh, uh, water loss through evaporation. So vapor pressure deficit is a, a VPD. It indicates that the gradient in water concentration, uh, what that gradient is from the terrestrial organism to the air. So the higher the value, the higher the vapor pressure deficit, the steeper the concentration gradient. So there's a bigger difference between the organism and the air. So in this uh, diagram, we have this beetle. He's sitting outside um, on uh, a sunny day. So uh, we're on, in the sun. So because we are sitting here in the sun, we know that the temperature, the temperature is high out here in the sun. And uh, because the temperature is high, it means the air molecules are pushing each other further apart. So there is um, more space uh, between the uh, air molecules for water. So uh, the water content of the air, the vapor content of the air, is well below 
saturation. So when we we are seeing that the molecules have have all spread out further apart, then um, whatever uh, air water there is in there, there's still room for for lots more water molecules. So there's a, a lot of water that could be filling out the air. When we look at the water vapor density um, inside the the organism, then we have a lot more water density of water inside the organism than we have outside. So the difference between what's in the organism, this density and the density outside is very different. So the vapor pressure deficit um, is going to be very high uh, in the air compared to inside the organism. So the organism is going to lose a lot of water because it's moving from where there's more water inside the organism to where there's less water um, saturating the air. Now let's say this organism crawls into the shade or uh, in this case we have a nice big fluffy cloud has covered the sun. Temperatures have dropped. When the temperatures have dropped the air molecules are going to be closer to each other so there's less space in here to put water molecules. So the um, uh, the low vapor pressure deficit indicates that the water vapor content of the air is close to saturation now. And so uh, there's less place for the water to move. So it's, there's lots in the organism, there's lots in the air. These values are much closer to each other, which means instead of before where there was a big difference, uh, here there's a much smaller difference um, in the vapor pressure deficit between the organism and the air. And so you have much lower evaporation. So um, if this animal's cooling itself off, uh, you think about temperature regulation, if it's cooling its off, self off, um, it actually is much more effectively cooling when the cloud wasn't in front of the sun than it is when the cloud moved in front of the sun. That also means that if you've got a lot of humidity in the air, if you're very, uh, very low vapor pressure deficit, so you have <clears throat> close to saturation in the air, you're not going to be able to cool yourself uh, very effectively. So we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, water is taken up by plants uh, from the soil and moves through the plants and uh, is used for photosynthesis and transpiration out of the leaf. Um, plants are kind of amazing because they're using some very basic laws of physics and uh, potential energy and can move water from the soil underground all the way up to the top of a really huge tree in the tropical rainforest that could be up to 116 meters tall. So uh, they also can take this uh, uh, pressure that the, the water has and uh, split rocks, split your concrete, buckle your sidewalks. Um, so it's very powerful and, uh, and they can get the water up then to their leaves for photosynthesis. And it is um, amazing. They don't have a heart like we do to pump the water through our body. Uh, they're doing all of this with some simple physics. Um, the water moves up the plant and, and uh, the, the water is evaporating out of the leaves. Remember we talked about transpiration being that uh, evaporative process of water out of the stoma and the stomata and the leaves. And so, uh, uh, so, so the, uh, this is the, the major water loss. Uh, remember that the leaves are sitting there uh, up in the air with those little holes, which are gonna allow carbon dioxide to go into the leaf, but as it's letting carbon dioxide go into the leaf, that's letting water go out, which was that process of transpiration. It's a T, transpiration. And that transpiration process is uh, actually an important part of the pump for uh, sucking up more water up into the leaves. So when we are looking at um, water flowing down its gradient, it's flowing down uh, a 
uh, water potential gradient. So it's moving through, uh, and uh, the water potential is basically the capacity of uh, water to do work. And so we use the Greek letter psi when we're dealing with water potentials. Uh, you probably have dealt with this before in chemistry class, probably biology class, maybe physics class. And uh, it is expressed in units of, of pressure, which are the megapascals is what we're going to be dealing with here. The potential of pure water, so pure H2O with no salt in it, no other compounds dissolved in it, is designated a uh, value of zero. And this is just by uh, common practice. Uh, pure water contains a lot of potential energy, but in this particular process, we are ignoring that. So, so uh, the water potential of pure H2O is uh, zero. And there's the, the psi letter that we'll be using here. So what is water potential? So um, you dealt with this uh, in other classes before when you're dealing with uh, osmosis. And uh, in your textbook, I'm not going to go over the details when they're talking about water movement in aquatic uh, environments across a semi-permeable membrane. Um, we were talking about uh, the process of osmosis. And so with a semi-permeable membrane, um, if we look at uh, here, we have on the left side, we have pure water. Um, and on one side of the membrane and on the other side of the membrane we have less than pure water we have glucose molecules on the right hand side of the membrane so we're going from an area with higher water uh, higher concentration of water to lower concentration of water so our water potential is going from a higher water potential to a lower po water potential so it's going to move across this membrane Here we have uh, setting up an experiment with water, pure water on one side. This would be a typical osmosis activity uh, where we've got uh, the water potential on the left side is zero megapascals. Water potential as it's, it's getting lower. So on the right side where we have uh, a solution, so we have a 0.1 molar solution, let's say it's a, a 0.1 molar solution of salt um, in the water, uh, it has reduced the water potential. So the water potential is lower than zero. So we're, we're going to be dealing with negative numbers here when we're dealing with lower water potential. So it's going from uh, an area where the water potential was zero to an area where the water potential is lower. It's going to go down that concentration gradient. So it's going to move from one side of the semi-permeable membrane. So the membrane only allows water through, doesn't allow the salt through. So when we're looking at water moving from soil into a plant, it has to go down the water potential gradient. So water potential is the capacity to form work, depends on the free energy content, and we have defined pure water having a water potential of zero. And in nature, because chemicals are dissolved in the water, water potentials are generally negative. So the more things dissolved in the water, the more negative the water potential is going to be. The water potential subsolute is actually the water potential uh, of a solution. So we can say that uh, uh, the the water potential has been reduced because of dissolved substances and make it a more negative number. So this is a portion of a diagram where we're looking at the water potentials uh, decrease. They become more negative as we go from the soil to the plant to the air. So in the soil, we have a high water potential. When we get into the uh, roots of the plant, in order for the, the water to move from the soil into the roots, it has to have, the root has to have a more negative water potential. So it has a lower water potential. For the water to go from the roots up to the branches of the tree, the branches, and you can see they do this with a lighter color blue, the branches of the tree are going to have to have 
a lower water potential than the roots for for the water to move up and we can see from it going from the uh, top of the tree out into the air the air has to have a lower water potential for the water potential to move out of the tree into the air and this is exactly the same diagram but what they have done here is they have added in the actual water potential in megapascals so we know the water potential of pure water is zero the water potential in the soil is a little bit lower than that there are dissolved compounds in the soil so the water potential of the soil is slightly um is, is the water potential of soil is less uh is less negative than the water potential in the tree so the water potential when we get into the tree into the roots of the tree is going to be a more negative number so we're going from zero to more negative numbers so as the water potential is dropping we know the water has to move from zero to a more negative number from there where it's uh, minus 0.9 up in this branch is minus 0.12 up in these leaves it's minus 0.22 up in the very top of the plant is going to be minus point or minus four uh, megapascals and the water potential out in the dry air is going to be minus 100 that has the high has the lowest water potential and so the water potential is going to go from where it's highest to lowest so just remember these are negative numbers we're going we're moving uh, to lower water potential so your highest water potential remember was down in the soil it's going to move out of the soil and up the tree We can summarize this with this equation where we can uh, represent the water potential of the plant as uh, being a combination of the uh, water potential, the reduction in water potential from uh, the solids. Um, we can also see the water potential from uh, what are known as matrix forces. Matrix forces are significant um, because they are uh, the consequence of a water's capacity to stick to the walls of containers. Remember, uh, water uh, H2O, we have the, the oxygen atom, which is quite big, and then it has a couple of little hydrogen atoms so that's the H2 and the oxygen atom uh, because it has a lot more protons in the nucleus the hydrogen only has one proton in the nucleus um, the electrons uh, like to spend time uh, spinning around the uh, nucleus of the oxygen more than they're attracted to the single proton in the hydrogen so the electrons spend more time over here and that gives you a more negative charge on one end of the molecule than the other so it has it's like a little magnet and so it's going to stick to other charges on on surfaces on on container walls such as cell walls or sticking to soil particles matrix forces are very high in clay clay has a very high surface area with charged surfaces the water sticks very much into the clay and uh, it's hard to to get the water back out of clay so we've got the um, matrix forces we've got the uh, the solutes from things that are dissolved in the water we've got the stickiness of the, the cell walls as we're going into the plant and then we have the um, this pressure portion of it is dealing with the reduction in water pressure uh, because of the transpiration out of the leaves so you think about the water evaporating through the stomata out of the little spaces in the leaves the that sort of basically leaving you more space for water to move up so it's almost like a vacuum sucking the water out of the leaves so we have these three processes going on uh, to move the soil off uh, to move the water from the soil into the plant and up the plant and out out the leaves of the tree into the air now the plant can get water out of the soil as long as the water potential in the plant is lower 
than the water potential in the soil. So the water potential in the plant has to be more negative than the water potential in the soil. And in that case, the water from the soil is going to move into the roots of the plant. Water enters the plant through the epidermal cells of the roots and travels into the xylem. Water potential in the cells of the roots increases when symporter pumps in the plasma membrane allow protons to pass into the cell, traveling down their concentration gradient. These pumps couple the transport of protons with the transport of minerals and other solutes into the cell. Water follows into the cell, driven by osmosis. The presence of aquaporin channels in the membrane enhances osmosis, allowing bulk flow of water from the soil into the roots. The vascular tissue extends from the leaves, through the stem, to the roots. Water is transported in xylem from the roots, where the water potential is higher, up to the leaves, where the water potential is lower. The arrangement of the tissues, the functions of the cells, and water potential determine the direction in which water will move through a plant. Water passes out of the leaf as water vapor through the stomata. The water vapor lost from the leaves is replaced with water that enters through the roots and is brought up through the stem in xylem. Xylem is composed of vessels, which are continuous tubes formed from dead, hollow, cylindrical cells arranged end to end, and tracheids, which are dead cells that taper as the ends overlap. This arrangement and the polar nature of water molecules allow water to pass in an unbroken stream through the xylem, from the roots, up through the shoot, and into the leaves. Adhesion is the attraction of water molecules to a surface, such as the wall of the xylem. Cohesion is hydrogen bonding between water molecules. Together, adhesion and cohesion allow water to move through the xylem in a continuous stream, from the roots, up through the stem to replace water lost from the leaves through the stomata. So here the 
uh, this diagram shows you these mechanisms of water movement going from the uh, soil through the plants all the way up to the atmosphere. So in the soil, when we're looking at the uh, water potential down in the soil part, it's going to uh, really be defined by the matrix pressure of the soil or the matrix uh, forces of the soil. The matrix forces, remember, is the um, a tendency of water to stick to things because it's a polar molecule. And so depending on the soil structure, uh, the compounds in the soil uh, could be holding more or less water. And uh, once you've taken out the water from the big spaces between the sand and the, the gravel and that, the soil is going to just be stuck in, uh, the water is going to be stuck in smaller and smaller spots onto the surfaces of those particles. And as I mentioned before, clay which can actually absorb quite a bit of, of water compared to a sandy soil. They hold, they have a very high water holding capacity, um, but thus the um, matrix forces in clay bind the water very tightly. Clay is actually tiny particles that are tiny uh, little platelets and, uh, and so that they have a very high surface area. They say that a tablespoon of clay, if you took all those little platelets and lay them out on the ground, one tablespoon, you'd be able to cover an entire football field. That's how much surface area there is holding, holding that water. So once we've got it into the roots, then we can um, see that within the plant, the, the water potential is going to depend on what is in the plant. So you might have sugars and starches down there in the roots that you uh, produce for photosynthesis um, and nutrients that you took out of the soil. Uh, we have matrix forces in the walls of the xylem. So the xylem, you think about the wood is mainly xylem and we make paper towels out of wood and you, you put the corner of a paper towel uh, in a puddle of water, it's going to suck that water all the way up uh, through those matrix forces and then uh, and then you have the the pressure remember the pressure is from the um, water evaporating out of the leaves so because of the hydrogen bonding between the water molecules this is the stickiness of the polar molecule the negative pressure created by the water evaporating from the surfaces of the leaves as well um, is going to pull the water um, up from the roots up the stem of the plants into the leaves and as the water evaporates from the leaves um, it's moving from a higher water potential in the leaf to a very low water potential in the air and the evaporation of water from the leaf surface reduces the water potential of the fluids in the leaf, creating a more negative water potential. So the further up the plant you go, the more negative the water potential is going to be. Also up there in the leaf, remember photosynthesis is happening and you're pumping a lot of sugar into that water now. So you're, you are making it even a lower water potential by uh, adding in all of those additional solutes. When we're looking at water movement between soils and plants, then uh, as long as the uh, the amount of water in the plant, the water potential in the plant is lower than that in the soil, the water is going to go from the soil into the plant. So think about what factors are going to influence the water potential in the soil. Obviously, the particle type is going to make a difference. The amount of organic material, the amount of clay, all of those things are going to affect the water potential within the soil. Uh, so what types of soils will have the highest water potentials? What types of soils are going to have the lowest water potentials? So which soils are going to be difficult to get water out of? So finishing this section uh, 6.1 of the chapter, you should be able to answer the concept review questions uh, at the end. Concept review question number one is looking at the uh, water uh, saturation in the air uh, graphs and asking you why uh, it's the same whether uh, however we're measuring it. And the uh, second one is number three. I think you should be able to answer why are the water potentials in nature generally negative. And then we can move on to the next section, which is how we regulate water. See you there.